Our goal is to have a touchless experience. You don't have to talk to a human. Sign up, single sign on with, with the major provider, one line install script, and then five minutes, you see what the potential is. That's the first aha moment. Welcome to 20 Minute Leaders. Just sit back, relax, and learn from the leaders of today. It's a journey. Each one is different, unique, inspiring. Let's get started. This episode is powered by J Ventures, a community-driven VC fund in Silicon Valley, in partnership with Leumitech, sponsored by Homeward Ventures, Hippo Insurance, Opus Labs, Synergy Global, Hillel at Stanford, Leap, Birthright Excel, Serona Partners, and in media partnership with C-Tech. Welcome to another episode of 20 Minute Leaders. Today, our guest is Leon Cooperman, this co-founder and CTO of Cast AI. Formerly Vice President of Security Products OCI at Oracle, Leon's professional experience spans tech companies such as IBM, Tuition, and Hosted PCI. He has more than 20 years of experience in product management, software design, and development, all through production deployment. And today we're talking about cloud and really the future of computing. Welcome, Leon. Cloud computing and, and you know, in general, where we're at today, it, we're really at an in- interesting inflection point. Not only do we see so many different organizations around the world that were previously you know, on, on-premise transitioning to the cloud, but I think that there is a, a wide understanding that you know, this is what's happening and this is where we're at. And obviously, COVID accelerated it. And the question has become less of, should we move to the cloud? It's more of a, how do we do it? And how do we optimize it? And how do we manage it? Especially with, with billing and DevOps, et cetera. You have a extraordinary experience and th- throughout your career leading up to Cast AI, most notably um, Vice President of Security Products, OCI at Oracle. Um, but, but today you're a part of a startup, Cast AI. And I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit about your, your own journey and how you're seeing cloud computing um, take place today and, and where we're at and, and what the opportunities are. So thank you very much for being here. Hey, Michael, thank you. And that's a great question. And just to kind of give you some context, my journey was to the cloud. It was very similar to my customers' journeys to the cloud. So, you know, so, <laughs> you know back 20 years ago when I was building applications, I was deploying them in co-location data centers at at Equinix and all the rest, just like everyone else was doing decades ago, right? And the last startup we did, which was called ZenEdge, we decided because, you know, lack of, you know, you don't have infinite funding. So you start with a cloud deployment and we deployed our, it's a cybersecurity product that we deployed in every region of AWS. So I don't know, there were hot, like 20 regions, 30 regions, whatever. And the thing, so the product did well, we got really good traction uh, with customers and analysts and in fact, it was acquired by Oracle, which you know led to a great outcome for investors. But the thing we failed miserably on was cloud cost management. I would have this every month, me and my CEO would get into it because we're like, the bill is exploding exponentially. I can't figure it out. I, I really struggled to figure it out for a lot of different reasons, right? And it, at the time, in the heat of battle, like we tried everything, reserved instances, savings, like you name it. We went through all of those kind of pillars of grief. Um, and then I would say that ultimately in that cost management pillar, we failed. And so uh, wh- while I was at Oracle, I kind of saw this recurring pattern with customers, with myself, with colleagues, with people that I knew. And I'm like, I can't be the only person that hasn't solved this cloud cost infrastructure problem. And it turns out to be a massive problem. It's like the number one existential problem for customers moving to the cloud. Like if you cannot figure this part out, If there isn't a proper financial operations environment for the cloud, we will see backwards movement. We'll see repatriation to data centers. Mm -hmm. And so if we're looking at taking a step back and we're looking at billing and and how cloud has changed the way customers think through billing, whether it's the the timeline, the ability to to predict um, the costs associated how is billing today different from you know billing perhaps 15 years ago or or what you know how how does this change the way people are are dealing with consumer behavior with billing as we transition to the cloud michael have you ever seen an aws bill like you literally have to be a rocket scientist to dissect that thing but that's not the main (laughs) problem like you could hire some really smart actuaries to figure out the bill the problem is who holds the keys to the kingdom 
15 years ago, how do you build a data center? Well, you have to go and ask for a bunch of money. It was capital expenditure or CapEx. So you would say, here, give me 5 million bucks. I'll go build this out in three data centers, da, 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 right? The financial team had to sign off on that. The operating expenses were predictable and known because they were multi-year contracts with whoever your providers were. The bandwidth provider, the data center provider, et cetera, et cetera. But that completely flipped on its head. And for good reason. The business said, you know, boards and CEOs said, look, we want faster innovation. So we're going to give the keys to the innovators, to the engineers, and we're going to figure out the financial part after. And it looked like a better OPEX model, operational expense, right? So we'll just pay for what we use. Engineers will order infrastructure and services. And when they don't need them, they'll shut them down. And the world is a great, happy place. The problem is, is engineers don't care about the costs of the resources they order. They're not, it's not one of their KPIs or any of their KPIs. They're not financially trained, right? They just want to get the engineering job done. And that's the fundamental shift in thought process. It's who is making the decision and it's not the financial folks. Therefore, you're going to have very lax financial controls. And you've seen this across all industries now where everyone's been hit with a bill unexpected and now they're scratching their head to figure out processes to fix it. So what I'm hearing from you is that there's, there's a few factors here that are contributing to, to a new situation in which uh, people are uncomfortable, right? There's a lack of control. There's a transition of control. And now they're, and what, with the transition of control, there's, there weren't really processes in place to manage it and to maintain that same sort of rigorous thinking and that same behavior from a company's perspective in the new world where now engineers are perhaps in control, they have the keys, and, and at the end, the technology is what drives the company, right? And, and so it's, it's hard to argue not to, not to continue the, these deployments. But why, so what do we do at that point? I mean, is the solution, do you think, to, to regain the control to those that are you know, in the higher management and the ones that previously were holding the keys? Or is it to change the way that we think through cloud uh, billing? Well, what, what are the different solutions we can present here? Yeah, so uh, the, the, the solution is not to give, not to create a bunch of gates uh, for financial folks to have to approve everything. They're just not going to, that'll completely stifle innovation and it reduces the promise of cloud entirely, right? So right. we might as well go back to data centers. The there is a new kind of breed of, of, of job in in startup world and in SaaS and is starting to prol proliferate through other organizations called FinTech. So, uh, sorry, FinOps. FinOps is the process of understanding your technology operations in the context of the, of the bill. And I've started, like, even like government agencies have started to create a FinOps position in their groups. So the idea there is, is you have an engineering-minded person that tries to understand, but Michael, I, there was a step in between where people said, we will solve this with better reporting. Let us do tagging. Tagging is a common practice in cloud to basically label resources for different departments and uses so that you can generate a cost report that is meaningful per department or per team. And then, so there was a whole wave of companies like uh, Cloud Health and many, many others that uh, right. were all eventually acquired that just generated reports. The problem with reports is nobody takes the, if there's a recommendation, no one will take it. Because if you are an engineer and you're responsible for a service and you have to get it up in the middle of the night, if it breaks, are you going to risk taking an uh, operation that has potentially destabilizing effect by, because you're reducing resources that may or may not be needed? You're not sure, right? So reports are not the answer and they're kind of an intermediate step we needed to get to in evolution. Here's the answer. The answer is automation, right? We don't have enough engineers, period, in the world. Like, we're completely short of, of engineers. Less engineers that can speak uh, cloud uh, dialects of AWS, Google, Azure, et cetera. You know, the world is kind of moving to a containerized modern application structure of microservices. And so there's a whole cloud native movement, another set of uh, engineering learning requirements you're putting on these teams. So by cloud native, I'm specifically referring to the uh, container and Kubernetes ecosystem. So the answer is automation. And that's what we're focused on. We're, we're, like, we're going to give you some reports to show you how you're doing, but the main thing we're trying to do is make sure you're not overspending systematically through machine-driven optimizations all of the time. 
So the CAS solution makes a decision every 15 seconds on every cluster that it operates against. Do we need to add capacity? Do we need to remove capacity? Do we need to swap capacity? Do we need to bin pack? What do we need to do to bring this cluster into its optimal shape without sacrificing service level objectives? And I, I believe that's the final goal is the autonomous operations of these low level systems. So I'm hearing that the thesis that, that you've come up with is that consumer behavior is changing. The world is changing. We're not going back to data centers. We have to make do with the fact that, you know, today the engineers, innovation runs the company and we need to allow for, you know, engineers and any engineer in the organization to perhaps deploy a cluster and, and go about their testing and about their, their, everything that they're doing engineering wise. But the key here is to actually do the optimizations to reduce the spending and to reduce the cloud. And yes, the you know, transparency and observability are important traits, but really it's the technology that allows you to actually optimize on your bill. And that is you know, cluster-based, instance-based, and it's not restructuring the operations of who decides how much money to spend and where. Yeah, because if you have that automation to put in place, it's, easily to, it's easy to create some role-based access to create those controls and structures. Like the report can go to the financial guy now, the right person on the DevOps team can make the decisions for what, how heavily to optimize, like what is, the, what is that progress bar look like? And I'll give you just a couple of examples, Michael. Like, you know, most DevOps engineers, when they create a cluster, they pick a computer type, an instance type in the cloud that they've worked with, that they know best. Oh, I'll use the M5 series because I've been using it for the last three years, great. Well. They're not experts on all of these other life cycles. Do they have reserved instances? Do they have savings plans that the finance team has already booked? Are there spot instances available that are tolerant to their workloads? Spot instances are these things that can get taken away very abruptly, but maybe your workload is super tolerant as a microservice. So they're not experts on all of these cloud financial terms. So when, our, when we come in, the first thing that we do when we analyze a cluster, and anyone can do this, by the way, it's a free service that we offer um, you can just sign up and do it. We tell you, like, you're using these instances. They're not actually optimal for these and these reasons. You know, you have memory heavy, memory heavy um, uh, workloads. You need to kind of skew to this way. And then we give you the, the outcome of that analysis, which you can just go implement yourself. But that's a point in time implementation. You know, you're going to drift immediately. Like a couple hours later, your requirements are going to change. That's why it's so important to have automation because it, the minute you optimize yourself, you will be out of sync within a couple of hours. Right. I mean, it kind of sounds like going to rent a car and you're so used to your five-seater Toyota Corolla, uh, but, but now you're just coming alone, perhaps. And you know, maybe that's not what you need, but you take it out of comfort because that's what you know and you know that it works, but maybe you're still paying seven times what you would pay if you actually used what, what you needed. Now, if you're looking at Cast AI today in the, landscape, in, in the cloud landscape, Walk me through your interaction with, you know, the consumer behavior of how, you know, from, from somebody identifies Cast AI as a, as a potential opportunity for their company, what is sort of the process that they go through until they reach that aha moment of, okay, I'm actually gaining value from this? There are kind of two schools of consumer behavior, the consumer that is already looking for a solution and the consumer that doesn't know he has a problem. And they're both really interesting journeys, right? So... We're, we're entering a potential shift in economic like outcome in the world. Like we might have a slowdown and we remember Michael, we've experienced growth for the last 10, 15 years nonstop, right? So everyone has just been adding fuel to the fire. Cost controls haven't been the number one thing on top of boards and CEOs minds lately, right? But what I'm seeing since we started cast and, and maybe it took us six months to kind of have the world catch up is People are now saying, okay, if we're going to go enter a slowdown, we're going to have to show some gross margin improvement. We're going to have to show uh, some cost controls. Where am I spending all my money? And to give you an example, like a company like Snapchat, a third of their revenue goes to cloud spend, a third, and that's in the billions of dollars, right? So imagine, you know, like that's the most sophisticated user of cloud where, you know, where that lies in the spectrum. So for those personas, for those people who are looking for a solution already, they tend to find us because if they're Kubernetes users, so like if you have a general workload and you haven't modernized your app, 
we're not for you and we, you probably wouldn't find our solution. But if you're a Kubernetes user, you'll probably find our solution. And our goal is to have a touchless experience. You don't have to talk to a human. Sign up, single sign on with, with a major provider, one line install script, and then five minutes, you see what the potential is. That's the first aha moment. Then it's the too good to be true moment. Let me call someone and figure out where the BS is, right? And that's when we get involved. We have a sales engineering team and an and, and account executive team. They get involved. They, we walk our customers through the process. And we usually do a proof of concept. We don't want to charge anyone any money if there's not going to be value there. So we say, okay, look, let's do a two-week POC. We're going to onboard your pre-prod or your prod clusters. We're going to show you the savings. We're, you know, we'll show you the money uh, from that movie uh, with Jerry Maguire. And then we end up doing a commercial deal after that. So that's kind of like the first persona. And then the second persona is when they we have customers that see the savings report and the reaction is like, I actually didn't know I needed a solution until I saw this. Like, I didn't realize how much money I'm wasting, right? Those are a little bit harder to get because they're harder to, like, if you don't know you have a problem, why are you going to take a phone call or, or like a Zoom meeting, right? Sure, right. If, if we're looking now at, you know, where we're headed, and uh, we're obviously we're talking about the consumer behavior that's shifted in the last few years pretty dramatically. And, and so I can only imagine, you know, what the world holds for us. Do, do you feel like we, we've reached sort of, you know, um, this, this is the new evolution of how, you know, tech companies are working or companies in general are managing their data and, and their innovation. This is it. Or, or do you expect that we're going to have some more dramatic changes that we need to that we need to account for? Yeah, so I think a lot of it depends on like the current uh, technology to like delivery model that companies are in. Like, there's, there's a big movement for continuous integration, continuous delivery. It's typically uh, uh, called CI/CD, um, but not a lot of companies are there. What I mean by that is they use the tools, but they release once a week or once a month. Like, I mean, for me, that is a terrible way of building software. Like, it's a way we built software 20 years ago when we were. 30 years ago when we shipped it. So I think that transformation has to happen fully. And we have to enter, everyone has to understand the service team model, which I don't think everyone does. This, and by the service team model, I kind of define it as a small team of five to 12 people that are specifically responsible for a set of microservices, but they're responsible for everything. They're responsible for the way the service is designed, the requirements, the way it's built, the way it's deployed, all of the DevOps, tasks all the way deploying it in production and then monitoring it and being on call. And my theory around this is if you're going to be on call for a service, you're going to be a lot more careful about how you write the code and you're going to make sure it's covered in tests properly. That transition has to happen and we're not fully there. We still have silos of QA teams and SRE teams and I, I think those are all going to be collapsed into a single engineering framework. Um, that's kind of one big trend that I see, Michael. Where, where are you in all of this? You know, in the world of cloud, in the world of you know the of optimization, you know anything that has to do with what you're doing. Where where are you in the center of it, and and why why sp why are you spending so much time in your career on these problems? Yeah, so like this is a kind of a passion project for me, and there's a couple of issues that I really hate about the cloud that have to get solved, right? And so my goal is to is to solve them like before I, I make my exit stage left uh, exit stage left so one of them is um, vendor lock-in I really don't like the fact the way that clouds are locking customers it, I, I understand why they're doing it but I don't like it and there's a couple of artificial barriers that need to be broken one of them is data gravity I am super passionate about this you can ship as much data as you want to any of the big clouds for free. They'll even ship you an appliance and say, load it all up on these SSDs and we'll load it up for you and you're not going to pay a penny. But if you ever want to get your data out, you're done. It's Hotel California. Like, check out anytime you want. But you're never going anywhere because it's too expensive to go anywhere. So it's an artificial barrier. They charge money for egress that they shouldn't be charging. It's a monopolistic behavior that I want to see come to an end. And that's that will give customers the freedom to move between infrastructures or have multiple infrastructures. That freeing up of the world is only going to lead to greater growth. So I think these clouds are getting in their own way uh, artificially, and I want to help the world kind of see the light on that. Uh, and then the second piece is 
we are so short on people and resources. And I think we're getting to a point in our supply chain crunch where we are getting to the point where Moore's law is going to fail. Like it, it, you, you're, you're familiar with the 18. So the idea here is, is that computing power doubles every 18 months. Therefore, costs should have every 18 months. That's only logical, right? Number of MIPS produced. But if all of your semiconductor innovation is centered in Taiwan, and you have all of these supply chain issues, and this is kind of where I'm spending a lot of time writing and researching right now, Michael, what happens if Taiwan goes away and we can't get the next generation of micron slimming improvements? Like we can't get those wafers any smaller for three to five more years because we're busy scrambling for just to keep up with car shortages and never mind data centers. Um, we are going to have a slowdown or a severe inflection in Moore's law. And that's going to lead to price increases, not decreases. So there, through automation, I believe we can solve all this by doing better with the resources we have. And by the way, when you shrink a customer's footprint, when you shrink their bill, you're doing one really amazing thing. You're shrinking the amount of electricity they use, the cooling that they use, the water waste that's generated, et cetera, et cetera. So overall, we don't need to be spewing wasted energy into the environment that doesn't need to be wasted. It's just a better use of the resources we have today. I love it. Uh, all in all, it sounds like a fascinating world. It sounds like a fascinating problem that you're tackling and really an enabler for companies to continue innovating and, and creating really meaningful products. And, uh, and, and, I, and I can't wait to try it out myself. And, and what, what I really like is the sort of the holistic view of, of cloud and, and where we're headed and, and understanding the, the shift in consumer behavior and, and where we're at. So Leon, I, I really want to thank you. It's been a pleasure. Uh, I really appreciate your time and, uh, and your energy and the insights. And thank you for the inspiration and best of luck with Cast AI. And stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.